Hear that? Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armor All, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every $20 you spend on Armor All products. That means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at ArmorAll.com. Armor All, less work, more clean. Terms apply. Single Tracks is psyched that Jameis Spikes has come on as a supporter of the podcast and is also a supporter of the website. Jameis has been designing and building quality bikes since 1979, and they were among the first to produce mountain bikes beginning in 1982. The brand has brought the world some iconic and award-winning mountain bikes over the past 40 or so years, and the Dragon has been the soul of the brand for decades. Introduced in 1993, the Jameis Dragon Hardtail delivers the feel that only comes with high-quality steel, and it's done so for nearly 30 years running. The newer Jameis Portal and Hardline full suspension bikes feature the innovative and race-proven 3VO suspension platform, built into both carbon and aluminum frame options. You can check out this year's all-new Dragon and 3VO bikes, along with the entire lineup of Jameis high-performance mountain bikes at JameisBikes.com. That's JameisBikes.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Single Tracks podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Joe McEwen. Joe is a career aerospace engineer and carbon composites expert who founded Starling Cycles in 2014. The brand's bikes are developed, engineered, and handmade for the demands of UK trails, and the bikes have been well-received among both the media and athletes. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Yeah, hello, everyone. So tell us, how did you get into mountain biking? Um... I, th- I think when I grew up, my house was opposite a bit of woodland. So my, my childhood was spent bombing around the woods on my bike, various bikes, BMXs and road bikes, but not, not really mountain biking as it was. So yeah. I rode bikes in the woods, but it wasn't until I'd actually then had a big period playing golf until my mid-20s. Oh, and wow. then, uh, yeah, so I was, I was quite a good golfer for a while and then got fed up of that and thought I needed to get a bit fitter. So I thought, right, I'll start riding my bike around the woods in Bristol and then uh-huh. just kind of got hooked into it and uh, bought, my, bought my first mountain bike and then just started riding more and more in Bristol and loving it more and more. And then it's it's got more, yeah, it's become the thing I do. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. I always joke that mountain biking is the new golf. And yeah. I didn't actually know yeah. that people did that, that people like transitioned from golf to mountain biking. But that's awesome that you did. Yeah. Well, so tell me what first piqued your interest in building steel bikes, you know, looking at your resume, it kind of seems like an unlikely choice for someone who's a carbon composites expert. So why steel? Why not carbon? Um, I think I I tried to get some projects um, as part of my job. So I was working at a research facility uh, in Bristol. Um, and I was trying to convince my boss to let me build a carbon bike as a, as a project, as a kind of mm-hmm. learning for us all. But they just, they just weren't interested. It was too much mm-hmm. of a distraction from, from the day job. So I thought, I still want to buy, make a bike. I'm an engineer, so I always make the things that I do. So when I played golf, I actually made a few golf clubs. I made a few oh, wow. golf clubs. Uh, before that, I was skateboarded a lot, and I made a couple of skateboard decks. So it's always... Mm-hmm something I've done is made, made bits for the hobbies I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, and the easiest way to get into making bikes is to go on a frame building course. So all the, all the frame building courses tend to be steel because that's the, the easiest thing to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd always ridden steel bikes as well. So uh, I've always had a steel hardtail. That's something I've always had. And my first proper mountain bike was a steel hardtail. Um, I had mm-hmm. a few steel, so I suppose when I when I started doing this, there weren't really that many steel enduro bikes or trail bikes. They just didn't exist. Cotic right. were kind of doing it. But there were a couple of companies doing steel downhill bikes. Um, I had a, an SWD, which is an American company, doing really mm-hmm. small-scale steel mountain bikes. So I, I bought downhill mm-hmm. bikes. So I actually bought one of them off Pink Bike. And then um, I bought so a Doberman Stella, which was a Canadian brand, I think, doing downhill bikes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I bought one of their steel downhill bikes. So I just felt, I love the, I love the feeling of the steel downhill bikes. They just felt damped. They felt great. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was the obvious thing to make a bike was to start making steel. Cause that's the easiest thing to get into, but I've also yeah. always been a lover of steel bikes. So it just, it just made sense. Carbon, yeah. carbon is very difficult to, 
to do in your shed where the steers are a little more accessible. <laughs> right, right. Have you tried building bikes with other materials like titanium or, I mean, I guess no. aluminum, that's a totally different game, but. Yeah, I suppose the, the, in terms of welding, the only welding I can do is brazing. So that's the only mm -hmm. skills I've got. Um, we've now got people in the workshop who can TIG, so we could potentially do, and he's done a bit of titanium work. He's done a bit of stainless mm -hmm. work. He's done aluminium, but we haven't got the equipment to do that. But um, yeah, we, 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 we're looking at other materials. We're always trying different stuff out, but uh, steel, steel is good. Nothing wrong with steel, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned the ride feel and yeah. how, you know, it's really good for all types of bikes, you know, from, you know, people think of hardtails first, but obviously, you know, steel's used for all kinds of bikes uh, from trail to enduro to downhill. Yeah. And a lot of people say that, you know, they like steel because it absorbs sort of the trail vibration better than other materials. I want to know, is that true? Like, can the average rider really feel a difference between steel and say another material like aluminum or titanium? I, th I, th I, th I think what's going on is it's because steel is stronger and it's heavier, um, mm -hmm. you, you can make it with smaller diameter tubes. So, okay. I, I constantly get this thing on my bikes. If I post up an image, somebody comes back and says, look at the seat stays. They're so skinny, it's going to snap. And I've never I've never had a seat stay snap on a bike. They just don't, they just don't snap. It's yeah. a very, very strong material. So because it's strong, you, you end up with small diameter tubes and those small diameter tubes are more flexible than larger diameter tubes. And it's a, okay. it's kind of a, it's a cube term or it's a square term, the, the stiffness of it. Aluminium, carbon fiber, lighter materials, you can get away with bigger diameter tubes. And there's there's always this belief that stiffer is better. So mm -hmm. automatically they go to the bigger diameter tubes because it gives a stiffer structure for the same for the same way. So I think it's it's not because of the materials themselves, it's because of the way you use the materials that results in the compliance that results. So typically yeah. steel frames, thin tubes, a bit more flexible, a bit more give in it, aluminium, carbon, bigger tubes, a bit more stiffness. Um, but mm -hmm. there's, there's also some other behaviours that I haven't quite got my head around. So um, hysteresis, 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 which is kind of how materials give back their energy. So mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, the, Aluminium, when aluminium fatigues, the reason it fatigues is because as you bend it and you let go, some some of the energy is kind of, I don't know, absorbed. And the same with mm -hmm. carbon fiber, it's it's got lots of fibers. As you bend it, it sort of damps mm -hmm. out the, the, so you lose a bit of energy in the bending of steel and aluminium. Or sorry, aluminium and carbon fiber as you bend it back. Okay. Whereas steel gives all its energy back. Um, or hmm. much higher proportion of its energy back, which which is the reason you have steel springs. You don't have aluminium or yeah. carbon springs. Um, right. So that's what gives steel a little bit of zing, I think. I think that as you as you push into it, all that energy comes back out and it sort of gives you a bit of zing, a bit of life, a bit of feeling about it. Right, um, yeah. And then I'll, I'll keep going. Some, some, some other things as well. The, the, uh, the small diameter tubes acoustically are kind of better if you've got a big tube it can it can make all the noises all the rattles in the frame louder it makes the, it's, a, it's a, like a sound box it's like a guitar sound yeah. box. It makes it's like a it's everything. like an aluminum baseball bat you think about yeah. that like when you hit a ball with that man that's it's a very distinct sound and you do yeah. hear that on the trail rocks pinging off of the bike yeah, and yeah, yeah. all sorts of things I've never hit a baseball bat, but I, 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 use, I use a golf analogy, which is when I play golf, <laughs> when I play golf, clubs had tiny little heads. Now everything's mm -hmm. massive and the noise they make is awful. It just sounds like someone's right. smashing some kind of. So I think that that acoustic element contributes a lot to the ride feeling as well. If your bike sounds silent, mm -hmm. if it sounds, you know, if you're not hearing these awful noises, you feel more confident and you, you, you sort of believe in it a bit more. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah, lots yeah. of aspects why steel has a bit of life or has that perception that it has some life to the ride compared to other materials. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm gonna have to make a mental note of that too. Like thinking about sound in terms of ride feel, you know, I mean, yeah. we review bikes and products all the time and we talk about ride feel, but sound, I guess, is something that I never really mm. associated with that, but you're right. Like that gives the product a feel. I mean, we may not be talking yeah. about like 
sensory touch, but we're talking about just sort of the overall, like, what do you think about it? What do you feel about mm. the product? And that's really interesting. So if you've, if you've ridden a bike that's absolutely silent and then it starts developing a rattle, you, you almost lose confidence in it. It's that's, <laughs> that silence True. is so important to allow you to concentrate yeah. as well. And it's, it's a mental sport, isn't it? Cycling really, mm -hmm. you know, however yeah. good our bikes are, we only go as fast as our brain lets us go. So everything right. to give us confidence in the bike is, is important. That's super interesting. Well, do you think as it's applied to mountain bikes and specifically when you get into like the longer travel bikes, is the material as noticeable? I mean, obviously you're going to have fat tires and suspension yeah. and other things that are going to play into that. And, and can you still feel that, that difference between steel and another material? Yeah, I, th I, th I think you can. The silence, we, we just talked about that. So that's, mm -hmm. that's an obvious one. But so I, I talk a lot about um, when your bike's going in a straight line um, and the suspension is acting in the plane of the bike, then you want the bike to be stiff so the suspension works properly. But it's not the, it's not the tube diameters that dictate that. It's the, the overall depth of the frame. So the frame is I know, 12 inches between top tube and down tube. That's what gives the whole frame its bending stiffness vertically. Um, so in that, in that, that sort of direction, you want the bike to be stiff, but then when you lean the bike over, the bike is, is bending sideways. So if you, if you put the bike at 45 degree late lean, mm -hmm. only half of the suspension force, or only half of the bump forces, sorry, are acting through the suspension. The rest okay. is acting to bend the bike sideways. So if you've mm -hmm. got a massively stiff bike, it means the bike can't bend, but as you go around corners, it's, it, can mo it can move in the plane of the suspension, but not in the other plane. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a bike which has got a bit of give and a bit of movement to it, it's almost acting like a sideways suspension. So mm -hmm. the more you lean the bike over, the more you want the bike to have that suspension. And I, it's not somewhere in my crazy head, I've got a design for a bike with sideways suspension. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like it it, it mm -hmm. bends in both planes. So yeah, yeah. this this people saying oh steel's rubbish because it's got compliance, um, so therefore your suspension doesn't work. It's rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. The the steel frame mm -hmm. in its whole is plenty stiff enough, but you've yeah. got this added movement going sideways. But you, you you write about the thing. Big fat tires do, perhaps do they dominate? I don't know. I've never done that equation. But I think I think when you start looking at deflection in wheels is quite important. Tires mm -hmm. is important. The frame is important. All of, all of these components add up to the whole. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know what what those components are, what you know, what what the contributions of those different things are. But yeah. I, I, de I definitely know any reviews that have been done on my bike always talk about grip in corners, and I know mm -hmm. grip in off camber sections. That's always something that comes back, and it, it, yeah, you know, it just feels like it grips. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess at the, at the extreme end of that though, I mean, like you said, steel is, is plenty stiff. Um, but you know, say you're like a cross country rider or somebody who's more interested in like pedal efficiency is steel gonna, gonna be maybe not as good a choice for that rider or, I, uh, um, this, this, this is, that too? this is, this, there's, there's lots of science in mountain biking, which is intuitively you think, right it needs to be as stiff as possible so that I can transmit all my pedal forces. Mm -hmm. But if you take a step back and look at what's actually going on, it, the, the science sort of falls apart. So this, this is an example of the stiffness. If, if the bike is stiff enough that as you push on the pedals, you can generate the full uh, leg force that you want, then mm -hmm. it's stiff enough. Making it any stiffer okay. doesn't generate, doesn't put any more forces through. If, mm -hmm. if the, if the pedaling forces cause the frame to distort a little bit, but you still can put full force in, the frame has to spring back. It doesn't lose energy unless it's losing heat energy. So unless your bike is warming up, you're not losing energy. <laughs> right. So there was actually, I think it was the Bicycle Academy in the UK, like a, a frame building center in, in the UK. Uh, somebody did a little study there where they looked at a very, very flexible road bike. And they looked at, as you pressed on the pedals, it did cause the frame to distort or bend sideways mm -hmm. but the force right. coming out the rear wheel was exactly the same compared mm -hmm. to a stiff bike so interesting it's it's this and yeah another way of thinking about it is if um say you're pushing on a floor on a wooden floor mm -hmm. you can push as hard as you want if you push right. with your foot on a, a sponge floor the sponge moves out of the way you can't generate the hard force 
-hmm. if you push on a, a solid steel floor, um, you probably generate the same force as the wooden floor. Right. So do you need a bike that's made of wood or a bike that's made out of the solid steel? You, you just need it to be, you just need it to be stiff enough. You don't need it yeah. to be, you don't need it to be very stiff. Yeah. Interesting. Well, another thing that I'm curious about is beyond the material, how does the tube shape and even like the bracing within the structure affect the ride feel? I mean, it seems like if you add extra bracing in certain places, you're going to, are you going to stiffen up the frame and lose some of those uh, qualities that you want from steel or, or how do those sort of interact? Um, so I think we, we, we kind of answered that saying that in the vertical plane, so the sort of depth of the, the frame, that's what mm -hmm. gives you a vertical kind of suspension stiffness, adding in braces okay. and stuff there. Generally you're doing it because for strength, because mm -hmm. you've, you've got some kind of weak point, but that won't affect the overall stiffness of the frame. Okay. Uh, and that, and that then applies to the tubes as well. So if you've got oval tubes, it makes mm -hmm. no difference to the overall vertical stiffness of the bike because you know, it's just the, the distance from the neutral axis. So you know, I'll start turning in, giving a load of engineering examples in a minute. But it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't affect the overall frame stiffness. Um, okay. Generally, why you've done things like change, yeah, tube profiles. I don't think it matters that much. <laughs> I, th I think even even sideways bending the frame sideways, it's just an, an oval will have the same sideways bending stiffness as a round if it's the same width so making mm -hmm. it a little bit wider but it's it's small bear it's it's small changes two profiles are for aesthetics i think braces oh, and any kind of strength that anything like that is for strengthening it's just to stop it breaking yeah interesting well your current frame builds most of them or maybe all of them rely heavily on reynolds tubing so why do yeah. you why do you choose Reynolds over tube stock from maybe other suppliers? Um, initially, I, I actually started using um, True Temper tubing, um, which I got from America. And the reason I did that was they they had BMX tube sets that were actually in quite mm. long lengths, and they they had tubing that worked for me. Uh, okay. But True Temper went bust, I think, or well, they didn't go bust, but they stopped producing bike tubes. Mm. Um, and when I first started off Reynolds, it was quite tricky to get small quantities out of them. It was, mm. they didn't, I think they're much better now. They're much better at doing that now. Yeah. Um, other brands, Columbus, the Dacia, the Italian one, really only cater for um, road bikes. They just don't do, mm. Interesting. they don't do tubes that are strong enough or thick enough walls for mountain bikes. Mm. They're just, they're just not strong enough. So yeah. I think Reynolds were, were kind of similar. And as I started producing more and more bikes, they've started producing me custom tube sets and they're, they're oh, really cool. good at doing that. So um, they're very easy to work with. They're very happily try different things out and they've, mm -hmm. they've been really supportive to me and really helpful. And the, the, the quality of their material, like the 853, the treated 853 is, is the strongest steel, sort of carbon steel tube set out there, I think at the moment. Mm. um it's good quality so yeah they're, they're very supportive it's local we know where their steel comes from the sort of uh got a bit of traceability which is good mm -hmm. yeah well you mentioned that you're able to get some custom tube sets from Reynolds. what does that mean like what are you customizing is it is it the length like do the tubes come kind of pre-sized to what you need for different parts of the bike or is it profiles or both or, or what is um, it? It's kind of thicknesses. So, um, yeah, I think my down tube, I've got my down tube is thicker towards where the main pivot is. And it's got a slightly slung, longer butt so that it butts up nicely against where the main pivot is. So I've got more mm. material there. We've increased the wall thickness in the center a little bit. Um, and then I, I think the it's not one of their fancy DZB, which is triple butted because we just don't need that. Mm -hmm. um, the top tube's pretty standard. The the seat tube is a custom bent seat tube for me, um, mm. so it's it's got the right bend and shape in it. So really, okay. it's, yeah, it's mostly it's mostly changing the butt profile thicknesses. Yeah, they do that one bent tube for me. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine, I mean, hearing you say that. I imagine you're not getting like a eight foot long steel tube in and you're like chopping it up for the bikes. I mean, if it's got a no. bend in a specific place yeah. or it's, you know, wall thicknesses vary in the center or towards the ends, yeah, yeah. 
you got to have them all sort of pre-sized. So is that how they yeah. come into the shop? They're already like right yeah, yeah. size so they, for the frames yeah. you need. So they come in, I think they're 850, 850 long, something like that. And the butts are in the right position. So they're, they're thicker at the, the, the bottom and the top or one end to mm-hmm. the other and then thin in the middle. Uh, and the okay. butts are positioned so that all my sizes of frames from small to extra large can be used on that one down tube. Um, okay. I think top tubes, we actually use a couple of different lengths of top tube with different butts. Seat tubes, mm-hmm. we, use, we use two different lengths with butts in different places and like swages in different places. So, but yeah, they turn up in the workshop and we, we do minimal kind of chopping off of the ends. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Not, not much waste. Yeah. I'm curious, like, what is the cost of tubing? Like a top tube, how much, how much do you pay oh, for a thousands, top tube? Thousands of pounds. Thousands of dollars. <laughs> now. <laughs> but I've just, I've just, I've just given them about 15,000 pounds for tubes. So they're, Whoa. they're quite, ex- they're surprisingly expensive. Um, yeah. like I think my down tubes are about 40 pounds, 30 pounds each. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're, yeah, not, they're mean, not cheap. Yeah. I'm sure it all adds up, but I don't know. I was thinking that one tube would be a few bucks, but that's, no, 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 no. that's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's very high quality material. It goes through a lot of processing. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot of effort. There's a lot of steps going. I think there's quite a good video on the Reynolds website where they show all the steps that they mm-hmm. go through to produce a tube. And it's, you know, it's like 50 steps for one tube just, wow. to, and what yeah. Reynolds don't actually produce the tubes. They buy round, um, stock from a, from a supplier in Germany of, of, mm-hmm. of the particular, uh, tubing. And they, all they do is butt it and profile it and heat treat oh, it. I see. Yeah. So it's not, Reynolds doesn't have a foundry in it producing tubes. They are, they are the, the factory that turns it, turns standard round tubes into mm-hmm. final heat treated bicycle tubes. Yeah. Interesting. A lot of steps there that yeah. I guess, I guess I had never considered. And yeah, I'm sure some of our listeners find that interesting as well. So are there certain design considerations that are unique to steel full suspension frames versus doing hardtails? Um, yeah, I suppose, yeah, I've only really ever made full suspension frames. We have, we have got a hardtail coming out soon. We've done, we've done a couple of commuter fancy commuter bikes that was just Mm -hmm. a bit of a design but they never really sold so um we've got a hardtail coming soon but a steel full suspension bike um i I suppose your your main design consideration is how are you going to manufacture it because steel Mm -hmm. is is expensive to get machines compared to aluminium um you've generally got straight tubes To, to bend tubes is quite tricky um, how are you, how are you actually going to make this thing and what processes are you, are you going to use to make it, uh, and trying to produce it in a way that keeps costs down. So I quite regularly, I'll get sent a CAD model by some excitable young kid who's drawn up a bike and they say, can you, can you make me this bike? And I go, I can make you that bike, but mm-hmm. you know, that machining is going to cost you 300 pounds. And that bit that you've got there, you can't make, you can't fabricate that. You can't. <laughs> yeah. So I think carbon lends itself to somebody drawing it up in 3d CAD and making lots of nice swoopy shapes and getting rid of any sharp angles and then and then you can design the tooling around it and produce a carbon bike aluminium you're much more open to machining complex shapes and you can you can create a whole area for your main pivot and your bottom bracket and all your linkages and stuff and you can create those more complex shapes steel Mm -hmm. because it's hard to machine because it's because it's heavy as well, you don't you don't want to use a lot of material. Although it's strong, mm. um, you can't machine things too thin because they start falling over. So there's sort of a minimum machining thickness. So inherently, it adds a little bit of weight to it. So you've you've got to keep things simple. You've got to keep things. I suppose I try to make it elegant would be the word I would use. So keep it simple, mm. keep it elegant, and then that lends to a, a bike that's efficient and lightweight, and you know has you know is a nice looking bike. So it's, right. it's, it's the manufacturing really that dictates what they look like. And I, I, I see lots of people doing, trying to do complex steel bikes and they're okay mm-hmm. as one offs, but doing more than more than one or two of them is, is going to be trouble. It's going to cost you money. It's not going to be, not going to be a good solution. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and I imagine too, with a full suspension, maybe one difference is, I mean, you're essentially creating the the front and the rear triangle separately i guess yeah yeah you 
you weld them up separately and then i mean you hope that they fit together in the end right yeah <laughs> yeah 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 uh we we actually get our our swing arms made in taiwan so it, it, initially i think the first maybe a hundred frames we were we were making all the swing arms in the uk and the swing arms are mm. quite hard um and they're they're standard sizes so it's sort of it lends itself to bigger batch pro uh, production um okay. so a few years ago, I did a batch of 100 frames that were fully Taiwanese made, but that mm -hmm. added complications that I had to plan what sizes I need. I could only do right. one model. Painting was more tricky. So the, the front triangle that now we do six, we do eight or nine different front triangles for the three different bikes or the three different main bikes and all the different sizes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite a large number, but we can just make them to demand whereas the swing arms right. we only have we only have two swing arms we have a, a swoop and a murmur and then the twist that's the murmur uh, the the mullet bike uses mm -hmm. the 27 swing arm so we can have yeah. swing arms sat on the sat on the shelf and then we make all the front triangles to order um so that's sort of yeah that that helps us what was the question <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that that answers the question but speaking of swing arms uh why is it that most steel bikes that we see, why are they single pivot designs? Why not something more, you know, four bar or other designs like that? I, th I think for this reason that if you, it, it's, it's weight inefficient to start machining parts. So generally if you've mm -hmm. got lots of linkages, so the, the steel bikes that are more multi pivots tend to have aluminum swing arms and aluminum linkages and stuff. So uh -huh. like a, a linkage rocker arm, if you made that out of steel and even if you made it, as weight efficient as possible, it would mm -hmm. still be much heavier than aluminium one. Whereas a a bike, a nice simple bike front triangle, you can make relatively light with with steel. It's when you when you start doing the machinings that it starts getting weight inefficient. So yeah, it's mainly a, a weight consideration. Although although I should caveat all of that, that weight doesn't matter. <laughs> like <laughs> right. the weight of a bike just doesn't matter. Like it, right. it does it does to a certain degree. If you if you bolted ten kilograms to your bike, it would matter. But whether you're riding with a full water bottle or an empty water bottle, you don't notice. And that's that's the sort of weight difference between a, a carbon bike and a, and, a, and a steel bike. So people get a bit upset with it, and they get obsessed with it. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. It's your size of your legs and it's uh, your wheels, how, how well your wheels spin and how well, how fast your tires roll and how light your wheels are. Matter. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, one of the questions that Jero was interested to learn about um, was about some of the design considerations that go into the head tube junction on yeah. your bikes and specifically how do you make that stiff enough when especially when you're looking at bikes with a really slack fork and you know that head tube angle it seems like there's a lot of forces that are involved there and how do you how do you keep that strong enough while also keeping the weight of the bike low um i, th I think it's less of an issue than you imagine like we we've, we've never had any head, head tube failures um so there's and you think BMXs, BMXs take all kinds of abuse and they're all steel mm. and they just have two tubes welded onto a thing. So there's just, just, just generally though two ways to solve, solve the problem. Um, you either put a little doubler, which is a little small gusset, which essentially doubles the thickness of the tube where you think it's going to fail. And there's different arguments about where you put it. Some people, I think, I think some of our bikes have got them and you've got a double under the top tube and under the down tube, which takes the, okay. one of the forces after, after <laughs> I should I have to draw myself a right. diagram and work out which force it's probably the compression yeah. forces. Um, the other school of thinking is on, on my bikes, I've got a gusset between the top tube and the down tube. And what you've done essentially is you, if you imagine an I beam, an I beam has a top flange and a bottom flange and then a web that joins it. And the mm -hmm. purpose of that web, is to well, transfer shear between top and bottom. So instead of having the top tube in both tension and compression and the bottom tube in both tension and compression, the web mm -hmm. between them means you put the top tube in tension, the bottom tube in compression, and you reduce the stresses. So the, the plate gusset that I've got on both sides almost increases the section locally so that you reduce the stresses. It increases okay. the bending section. So we did, yeah. I actually did quite a bit of CAD work or sort of FE work looking at this because 
people don't like those gussets because occasionally people design those gussets really badly where they just put a big triangle on. And if you just put a big triangle on, quite often it creates stress raises that then cause the, the tubes to fail at the end of the gusset. So if you look oh, at my wow. gussets, if you look at my gussets, they've got a nice long leg, which means the loads gradually track into the gusset and then they can be okay. transferred for and then they gradually track their way out. So you've, you've got to have intelligent design of that gusset. But yeah. if you do it, it's quite a good solution. It's quite a good way of, of reducing the stresses. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about that and, and you answered it, you know, using finite uh, element analysis yeah. on the designs and figuring out like, where are those stresses going to be concentrated? Yeah. Um, I mean, I imagine too, though, you know, you could maybe in the old days would people just kind of look at where a bike fails and then say, oh, we need yeah. to reinforce that. But now it sounds like you're able to, to do that all. Um, FFE is... I my, my background is now I was an aerospace stress engineer. I've done loads of FE. I've spent years mm -hmm. doing it. To me, it's a marketing tool. It's it's what you <laughs> you you produce a nice fancy picture that you can show to the managers and say, oh look, yeah. we know what we've done. Everything yeah. needs to be backed up with good engineering knowledge and hand calculations. And mm -hmm. an, an FE model is only as good as the information you put into it. And uh -huh. there's a lot of people who are taking their CAD models. And applying nonsense loads to it, and then saying, "Oh, look, our bike is great, isn't it? We've done, we've done, <laughs> we've optimized it." It's a good engineer can tell you where something will break, and that is much more important than than FE. You know, yeah, there's, there's so many risks of getting it wrong. So yeah, yeah, the the if it if it doesn't look right, that's almost more important. If it doesn't look right, it probably isn't right, and FE is going to tell you <laughs> isn't going to tell you anything different, really. Right, so, right. Where we used it was in a, a specific location where we had a, a problem that we could idealize very simply and understand the mm -hmm. behavior. So we, we took it out as a, a very simple case. But if we just run the whole bike into FE, you would you would gain nothing from it. It would be right. good for marketing, good for your good for your, your <laughs> press release, but that's about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you bring up a really good point about sort of the data that you load in and, and how you're actually looking at the bike. You know, I, I studied structural engineering in school and, um, you know, this was, this was though looking at things like bridges or buildings and it's like, yeah. that's a static thing. Yeah. Whereas a bike I imagine is really complicated because of just all the different positions that a bike could be yeah, in yeah. the different ways that you're loading it. And I'm wondering with your experience uh, in the aircraft industry, I mean, which is harder like to, to analyze? Is it, is it an aircraft wing or is it a bike? I mean, which one of those is like more complicated in terms of the, the, the forces at play? Yeah. The, the, the big issue is with the forces it's uh, on an aeroplane, we were given a load set. You had a whole department dedicated to determining the loads on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's based on years and years of experience and refinement and testing and then those top level aircraft loads, you kind of follow down through the various components and there's processes mm -hmm. and various levels of FE to understand load transfer and all this stuff. So it's, it's very, very well understood. And then once you know the forces acting on something, it's very easy to analyze it and you can, you can do lots of different levels of analyzing. The loading on a bike is, is massively complicated because all the cases that are causing that loading tend to be strange dynamic cases. So crashes or big heavy landings or mm -hmm. you know or things that you don't even predict you know and then going around a corner and hitting a rock and then stamping on the pedal or you know all these weird <laughs> cases that you can't predict right. and yeah. the, that data doesn't really exist i'm sure the mm. i'm sure the big companies have got pretty good loading data mm -hmm. um but you because there's so many unknowns and because it's so dominated by so an aircraft you've got the air you've got the engines and you've got the air, the air pressures and it's all pretty well understood the bike loading is dominated by the rider who is moving all over the place and he's changing position all the time so right. uh, and people ride in different ways so mm -hmm. how do you how do you determine so mm -hmm. I, I would every company you you can do cen testing which sort of says the bike is the, the CEN testing basically rides it into a wall and does a sort of a bit of a drop. And yeah. there's a few other companies now who have developed some better testing. There's a company in Germany called EFBE who have developed high level tests. 
high level testing that they understand that they've sort of proved with more sort of empirical data um but yeah even then you're still relying on proper rider input and riders you know sessioning it. I, I i'm quite lucky i've got one of my riders uh reese he's, he's boosted brin he's called and not mm. only is he an amazing rider and he just hucks off massive things but he's also an absolutely useless mechanic so he's the perfect <laughs> he's the perfect bike tester that he doesn't right. look after his bike and yeah. he rides it really hard so we know that survives him we're, we're pretty good and, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's that that loading thing is is so difficult to understand and even when they start loading up bicycles with lots of sensors and stuff you only you're only understanding sort of ba- the basic accelerations on the bike. You probably mm-hmm. don't understand yeah. how the geometry is changing. So it's it's a it's a much more complex loading situation than there is on a on an aeroplane. Yeah, interesting. I always find it fascinating too, like the connection between the aerospace industry and bikes. And and you know, I mean, I think even from the early days, right? The Wright brothers they they owned a bike shop. As far right, as I, okay, I didn't I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. okay. What you find is. I don't know. I, I, most mountain bikers seem to come from some kind of engineering background, or they they sort of they're tinkerers. They like the the whole uh, having a bike that needs fiddling with is something they enjoy. Whereas road yeah. bikers tend to be. I don't know many mountain bikers who are doctors or lawyers. I know <laughs> lots and I know lots and lots of mountain bikers who are engineers or yeah, uh, carpenters or joiners or you know they're, they're yeah yeah. So I think I a... think go. It's such an interesting sort of technical challenge. I mean, if we yeah. think about bikes, you know, I mean, they have to be light, but they also have to perform and, mm. you know, same with airplanes, right? I mean, you got to make them as light as possible, but you need them to be as strong as possible. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And, and you don't even see that with cars necessarily, right? Like no. there's not always a big push. I mean, maybe with electrics now, but you know, there hasn't traditionally been a big push to like, we really have to get this thing right and use mm. the right materials and, and all that to, to really optimize it. So. Yeah. I think, I think cars are fundamentally designed for manufacture, aren't they? Everything is about manufacturing and you, mm. you could save a few grams, but nobody cares. It has to be able to, you <laughs> have to be able to produce 10,000 of them in an hour. And, you know, it's, it's right. crazy, but bikes do get like that. And I think, I think, um, I'll be a bit cynical here about carbon bikes that my, I think the reason why there's so many carbon bikes is there's a perceived, they are, you know, the material in itself is, um, if used properly is a lighter weight for, uh, is for a given strength or is stronger for a given weight. So it's got a higher specific strength, but when it's used in bicycles, I think everything's massively overbuilt. And if you actually have a look mm. at a lot of carbon frames, they're not that much lighter. Uh, until you get <laughs> yeah. to the very, very top end road bikes, but then they cost mm-hmm. huge amounts of money. Um, right. What's What's good about, or what I think the ma- is good for manufacturers of carbon fiber is that it's unskilled manufacturing in, in assembling. Once you've spent all the money on tooling and a process, you can mm-hmm. get anybody to you can get anybody just to shove the carbon fiber into a tool, follow a process, press go mm-hmm. at the end, cook it, it comes out. Um, whereas, so what you see is lots of the carbon bikes are manufactured in China where labor rates are cheaper and labor is less skilled. Mm -hmm. All of the welded bikes are made in Taiwan where they're made by skilled, skilled welders who have got lots of experience. Uh And so for big Mr. Bike manufacturer, it's almost the McDonald's of bikes, carbon fiber. Once you've got the process right and you've got it you've got the process under control and that is a difficult thing. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from that. It's a very easy way to produce lots of bikes at a perceived high value compared to aluminium or steel where it's a high skilled job. You've got to pay high, what, higher wages, produce it in a mm-hmm. higher cost country. Yeah. Anyway, bit, a bit of controversy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, yeah. The way you describe it too, it's, it sounds like it is maybe more akin to the auto manufacturing model uh, where mm-hmm. you can sort of standardize it and and use different labor inputs to get it done, yeah. and yeah, it's kind of a different different way to go. Well, let's get back to sort of talking about uh, how you design steel bikes. So, why do some bikes like the Murmur, uh, the Murmur Trail specifically, need a brace between the top tube and the seat tube? 
So that that actually isn't the Murma Trail. That is just the XL oh. bike. So it's nothing. Oh, all, just the extra large. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's just that the image on the website of that Murma Trail is of an XL. So what what okay. on the XL bike? If you have the top tube moving up proportionally as it would with the other sizes, the bike mm-hmm. looks like a bit of a gate. So the the XL actually has the top tube at the same position as the large bike but then a okay. longer seat tube and because the seat tube's sticking out a bit further you, you need a little brace to support it so yeah. it's kind of driven by aesthetics it just big big frames just don't look that good <laughs> so they they, <laughs> they look a bit better if you get the angles looking nicer if you drop that top yeah. tube it looks a bit interesting so, yeah uh, so is that standover height then that's kind of dictating that, um, that you keep the top tube at the same position no it's, it's, it's aesthetics it just doesn't look mm-hmm. as nice People, people with long legs don't need top tube clearance. They, they'd be, yeah. they'd be fine with the top tube in the high <laughs> position, but it just, right. it just yeah. looks bad. So another question I have is how you're able to dial in bottom bracket stiffness when building with steel. Again, this is a spot, I guess, where I don't know. I would imagine you could feel that more when you're pedaling, because pedaling is kind of side to side, right? Like you're going to maybe potentially feel some of that twist in the frame. So, what can you do to to dial in the bottom bracket stiffness there, or does it even matter? I, I don't think it even matters. It, it goes back to what we were saying before. Um, you still get all those forces out, so I, I I don't think it matters. I've never I've never even thought about it. It's never a comment I've had back is that my bikes feel flexible whilst whilst pedaling and it, it yeah. yeah i get it with i, I supplied middle bone cranks with my bikes which are uh, uk manufactured and they're they're these the most beautiful kind of aesthetic tactile things in the world but people always look at them and go oh they're too skinny they're bent and they just don't they just don't it's it's yeah. this it's back to this whole pseudoscience thing oh it has to be as stiff as possible we want everything as big as possible and in right. reality it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter so yeah. it's just it's just that we we intuitively think oh stiffness we need it to be stiff so it pedals better we don't take right. a step back and think about does it actually matter yeah well i mean you mentioned too though how aesthetics does drive some of the decisions mm. and and it's not always about you know making it strong or strong enough Sometimes it just has to look right to people. Yeah. And I think with carbon too, I mean, you, like you said, a lot of those bikes are overbuilt and, you know, in that case, it's not like a, a look or anything that people are going for. It's really riders, you know, for years just didn't trust it. I mean, they were yeah. afraid that like this, it looks like it's going to break. It's too light, yeah, yeah. you know, it feels plasticky, but yeah, I mean, I guess in a lot of ways, we're not we're not really rational when it comes to our bikes, are we? Like mm. we just kind of look but, at them and we form a judgment. But that's, I think that's, I think that's actually really important. And I think aesthetics is is really important because it it, it kind of goes back to we our bikes are all way more capable than we are, unless you're very very top level. Our bikes are massively capable. What what mm-hmm. makes what is your what's the best run you've ever had? It's when it's when you focus, isn't it? It's when you're absolutely in the zone. You get to the bottom and you're like, you almost don't know how it's happened, but you know you've you've zoomed down. So a lot of that is confidence in your bike. So if your bike looks good and you're standing there looking at it, going, I like this, <laughs> fast on this, that is really important. That is really important yeah. to how well you ride. And whereas if you look at it and it's, you know, all, all the angles look funny and you don't like the look of it, you, you're not going to have any confidence. You're not going to be willing to you know push into the corners and really really drive it in so it's, it's really yeah. important aesthetics it's uh yeah it's key i think yeah well and i think part of the takeaway for me is to to trust the bike designers right i mean yeah. like you've done the analysis and whether i think it looks like it's going to be strong or not mm. that's you know maybe not that that important i mean bikes do fail but it's pretty rare so i think yeah maybe we could all do better to just trust that the bike has been designed and, and to give it a ride and yeah. see how it, so it actually does feel it's not in the interest of bike companies to have bikes that break it, it would be the end of the company <laughs> right. the right. It, you know if failures are so highlighted these days it's you know it's just you wouldn't have a company if your bikes didn't mm-hmm. last the word gets around so quick and yeah. There are quite people do have quite a lot of warranty issues, but they tend to be non-catastrophic stuff, don't they? And they tend to be little pernickety things. And I think customers are quite accepting of that. But you know, yeah. I think uh, yeah, they're, they're, you know, and we we have certification testing to ensure 
there aren't going to be big failures. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, they're pretty good things. Yeah. Well, with all the recent supply chain disruptions, I'm curious to know how that's affected your frame business. Um, you know, on the one hand, it seems like maybe you're in a good position because you kind of build frames, you know, as the orders come in sizing and, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But on the other hand, I imagine it's hard to get supplies. So, so what, what's it like right now? Um, in, in terms of building frames, we're pretty good. We can get all the materials we need to build frames. So we, we can mm -hmm. do that. Um, and in the past we've sold typically a frame, maybe a shock, maybe the odd fork, you know, a few odds build components. So we, we've mm -hmm. had good supply of parts. As, as time's gone on, because people can't buy components elsewhere, mm -hmm. people are requesting more and more full builds and yeah, yeah I'm really struggling. So we're, we're pretty good. We've got shocks, we've got dropper posts, we've got wheels, we've got handlebars and stems and all the build kit parts. Um, mm -hmm. Brakes, we've got a good supply of. Forks mm -hmm. is really tricky. We're, mm -hmm. we're struggling to get hold of forks. Uh, Drive trains is, is really hard. So oh, I've, yeah, so those two parts we've we've, and what it's meaning is I'm having to spend more money stocking up and building up my stock so mm -hmm. that I've got them. Whereas in the past I could order much later, you know, I could be more flexible. Right. But now I'm having to put in big orders for less range of parts just so I get them and that I've got them sat there. So it's it's really hard. It's it's the the big peak we saw last year when everybody was buying bikes and i think every bike mm -hmm. company went through it is now turning into a lot of pain <laughs> a lot of, a lot <laughs> right. of pain yeah. and there's there's other issues with um so i say my swing arms come from taiwan there's been a bit of delay and slip there because of i think because covid and just demand but mm -hmm. the shipping costs is absolutely mental now so the cost oh, of getting a shipping container is yeah it's gone up five or six times and I know, mm -hmm. I know some brands that I've been speaking to selling lower cost frames or lower cost bikes where the increase in the shipping is all of their profit. So they're, they're oh, basically geez. just filling warehouses in China and Taiwan with bikes that they can't afford to ship because they would make no money on them. Oh, right. So it's, yeah. it's uh, yeah, really tricky. Yeah, interesting. Well, it, I, I'm surprised too that a lot of companies in that specific position aren't raising their prices you know yeah. i mean are th do, you, do you feel that from consumers that they there would be a lot of pushback if you did have to raise your prices i i think i um it's difficult you don't want to do it um yeah uh, so people don't want to do it and i suppose there was i think about six months ago everybody went through a price rate a price increase mm -hmm. there's sort of a few companies did it and then everybody followed suit and i mm -hmm. think there is another one due, um, but nobody's been brave enough to do it yet. But as soon as as soon as one as soon as one company puts their prices up, I think everyone will because the costs of everything are going up. Every, you know, yeah. everyone knows it for everything is going up. So, um, yeah. yeah, we will. We well, will see and I it. think it seems like bikes perhaps are are more affected than other things. You know, that we're used to buying in that, like you're saying. It, there's so many components that go into a bike build and you could have every part except for one and it's not a bike. And so yeah. to get all of those lined up and to have all of them mm. delivered and available, yeah, it seems like it's a nightmare and hopefully something that's going to be resolved soon. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's getting resolved. <laughs> I don't think it's getting resolved soon. And I think it yeah. is affecting, I think it's affecting everything. I know talking yeah. about golf, somebody I was speaking to was saying they can't buy golf clubs, uh, golf clubs, uh, golf clubs at the moment because of supply mm -hmm. issues. It's it's affecting everything at the moment. Um, mm. It's just we know about bikes, so we're just we're just paying attention <laughs> to bikes. I think. Right, right. But in terms of in terms of when it's going to get resolved, I don't know. I think so. Shimano have got a new factory on uh, that they're building, haven't they? But that's a couple of years away. So yeah, you know. <laughs> Demand has gone up, supply has gone down, people are stockpiling, people are hanging mm -hmm. on to bits, you know, like 12 speed chains. There's no 12 speed chains in the country. So oh, wow. if, if 12 speed chains turn up, everyone's just going to buy loads of them <laughs> because, <laughs> because they, right. they'll be worried about it. So it's, everyone's just stockpiling stuff, which, which just adds to everything even more. So uh, single right. speed oh, bikes, I think. <laughs> 
Jeez. Yeah. That's, that's hard to get your head around how yeah. interwoven all of this is and, and how yeah. many different things need to get fixed to, to get things moving again. Well, one interesting component uh, to a lot of people, the alternative to the traditional drivetrain is the gearbox. And Starling has a gearbox driven model, the Spur, um, that we wrote about several weeks ago and it was super popular with our readers. So I'm curious to know what you're hearing about from people who maybe bought the bike and then other people who saw it and are just like, wow, this thing, this thing looks really interesting. I swear to begin with, nobody's bought it yet because we're, we're just making the first batch. So that was, that was, oh, okay. we'll be, we'll be sending you as the press release for the, the production batch. So we've got, we've got a couple of prototypes riding around one that's been ridden around by someone in South Wales for a couple of years and I've had one for 18 months. Um, okay. So, so they ride great and we've, you know, we've had no issues with them. So it's, it's, it's a great product, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they're received by, by customers. So hopefully they'll go out towards the end of the year and that'll be really interesting. But, um, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, a it's a, it's a, the, the gearbox is a great thing. A derailleur is a terrible thing on a bike, but they do work pretty well and they have, they have got better as time has gone on. Like they, mm-hmm. I don't know, 10 years ago, they barely lasted five seconds and they were constantly getting right. knocked off and they never worked quite properly. They are pretty good now. I've, I've got to say, but mm-hmm the benefits of the gearbox in that everything's a bit more robust. It's maintenance is zero. Pretty much you change the oil once every six months, uh, with bike design, I think it helps quite a lot. So with my, with the Effigear system, you can have a sort of highish pivot. Um, you can have a single speed chain with the same, with the same chain line, um, which means that runs a lot better. You've got rid of a, a whole load of mass at the rear wheel. So the suspension is absolutely amazing. It's so supple because mm. the rear wheel is so light. So there's lots of other yeah. knock on benefits on top of just having the gearbox. But there is a little bit of a negative that at the moment there is a little bit of drag in the system. So it, it it's great. And as a sort of up and down bike or, you know, slowly winching up the hills and plummeting down or actually going up technical climbs, it's absolutely amazing because mm-hmm. the rear wheel is so light, it just grips. But you wouldn't yeah. want it as a cross country bike. You wouldn't want it as a sort of bike to to ride loads and loads of miles on. But maybe that'll come. Maybe maybe it will develop. But I I don't think there's any incentive for the the big players to to develop a gearbox really. Yeah, not, interesting. Not for a while. Yeah. So yeah, you think this is this is never going to be something that gets like really wide adoption? It's just uh, an alternative for people who maybe yeah value kind of what the gearbox offers over a derailleur. Mm. So I, ju- I just think Mr. Mr. Shimano building his new factory, unless he's building his new factory to build gearboxes, which I mm-hmm. doubt because he would have approached. <laughs> you know, there's you know there's a massive amount of investment to change over your production. And I know they've done it with mm-hmm. e-bikes and stuff, but that's a bit more of a certain market. They've probably got more confidence right. that. Um, so the, the gearboxes will probably only be adopted by mountain bikers and commuters. And commuters mm-hmm. have got hub gears. They're not too fussed about it. So you, you could argue in, right. it's a relatively small market compared to, I don't know. I'm not yeah. Mr. Shimano. I'm not Mr. Sram. I don't know what's going through their heads. But yeah. to me, it's, it's a high risk. And they're unlikely For to sure. they're unlikely to to accept that risk until they know there's definite benefits. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like there's always a lot of interest from mm. riders. And like I said, our readers especially were like, "Wow, gearbox!" But then at the end of the day, not it doesn't seem like people actually end up putting one on their bikes. And yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what the disconnect is. Is it is it uh, just the novelty of it that people are interested in, or or is it something that they're like waiting for some big improvement to see where like it finally makes sense or, or they're able to get over that hump. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see when these, when these bikes go out, because I, I, I love mine, but I ride it, I don't know, 30% of the time and mm-hmm. 50% of the, well, I'll probably, I'll probably ride my single speed 30% of the time. That's brilliant. I ride my Murmur, which is my sort of trail bike a third of the time. And I ride the, the gearbox bike a third of the time. It's, but if I know I'm going out for a four hour ride, three hour ride, I wouldn't take the gearbox bike. If I'm going for a couple of hours to ride some downhills and, you know, ride some technical stuff, I'll take the gearbox bike. So, hmm. yeah, it's not, 
everyone seems to want one bike that does it all it's not it's not that it's just an extra bike okay. to add, add to your arsenal i suppose but it'll be interesting to see what the feedback from customers is and some people will love it some people will will not get on with it right so it's, it's yeah yeah it's, it's tricky it's tricky interesting but yeah it's uh yeah well speaking of another interesting development what are your thoughts on the rising popularity of mixed wheel bikes yeah yeah mullet mullet it's, it's you know i've 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 kind of well, i've kind of convinced myself of the science of of wheel size that there's there's no difference in people talk about our oh, bigger wheels have got better rollover and if you actually look at a 29 compared to a 27 mm -hmm. and you imagine like a, a 50 mil bump 50 mil high bump two inch high bump um where it hits the wheel there's there's negligible change in the angle it hits the wheel up so when you start getting to bigger okay. wheel lumps that are close to the axle it does matter but that's not rollover that's that's something else you've got to pull up so i don't think it affects rollover acceleration it actually doesn't affect acceleration because although the bigger wheel is is bigger it's actually rotates slower because it's bigger and it rotates proportionally mm -hmm. slower so the amount of it spinning energy is actually the same between different size wheels so there's no acceleration. The only difference is the wheel is bigger. So overall it weighs more, but that in terms of bike plus rider weight is, is timing. So that doesn't matter. Um, people say this ridiculous thing, oh, bigger tires have got a bigger contact patch. And this, this is the one that winds me up the most. Contact patch is only a function of the pressure in the tire. So the right. pressure times the area is the force that supports the rider's weight. So a okay. three in, a three inch tire with twenty psi has got exactly the same contact patch as a a one inch tire with twenty psi on. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do, and a twenty nine inch or a twenty seven, it makes no difference to the contact patch. So yeah, that one drives that one drives me mad because it's really simple science. But everyone goes, <laughs> oh, fat fat tires have got bigger contact patch. They haven't. It's just that a flat tire you can run at a lower pressure because right. it's got more volume to it. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. It, it's a bit more suspension. So you don't whack the rims, but yeah. so the, the thing I've kind of concluded about the wheels is the, the bigger wheels have got more gyroscopic stability as the wheel is spinning it's it's tendency to stay in plane, to stay rotating in that same plane. That property is a function of the radius squared. So the bigger wheel a 29 will be proportionally greater than, um, a 27 and a half. So what it means mm -hmm. is. As you're riding along, the, the wheel is sort of less likely to get knocked off line. And, and you can okay. you can feel it when you ride a 29 inch bike, you have to put more effort into leaning the bike over. You mm -hmm. can feel like it needs more effort. Um, yeah. But then once it's lent over, it's more stable and it sits there. So 29s, I, the first thing I felt when I rode a 29 was I could do a two wheel drift absolutely amazingly because it was just so <laughs> stable in that, that two wheel drift position. It just sat right. But then it's harder to move it around. So if, if you were the sort of person able to do a big whip off a jump, a 29 is going to be harder because you've got a, it's more of that gyroscopic oh, stability. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, the, the thing I try to say to people, if you're uh, somebody who likes to hop and jump off, you know, just continually changing line, always hopping over routes, always moving their bike around, always flicking it left to right, you don't mm -hmm. want a 29-inch bike. You want a smaller-wheeled bike, and I suppose like a BMX, right. which is really manoeuvrable. Mm -hmm. The big-wheel bikes aren't manoeuvrable, but they track and they carry speed, and they're – imagine riding the bigger wheels into a rock garden. The, the, the wheel isn't going to get kicked off line, so it's carrying mm -hmm. more forward momentum. So that's the, that's the perceived rollover, is that it doesn't mm -hmm. get kicked off line. It just keeps going straight. So right. the, if, you, if you sort of follow that logic through – a mullet bike sort of makes sense that you've got the front wheel, which is the one that steers and the one that tracks through, which is the big stable one. And then the rear mm -hmm. one, which can be moved around. It doesn't matter. It just follows. So, and mm -hmm. the, 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 the smaller rear wheel allows shorter stays, which people seem to like for a bit of, a bit of pop and a bit of maneuverability. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's, it's not, it's not a golden ticket. A mullet bike it's just the halfway point between a 29 and a 27 so yeah you know it doesn't it's not that this is a 20 a 29 is 8 out of 10 and or a 29 is 6 out of 10 and a 27 is 5 out of 10 and a, a mullet <laughs> is 10 out of 10 
it's just halfway <laughs> between the two, you know. Right. So yeah. anyone saying it's it's you know it's it's magic or anything, I, I just don't believe it. It's just it's just a little bit different. Some people, yeah. uh, you know, the biggest benefit is probably people with short legs who rub their tire on a 29 inch bike on their bum on a, mm-hmm. on a 29 inch bike. That's a, that's a definite positive. So I, I, yeah. And, and again, if you're somebody, yeah, I, I it's a halfway house. We're, we're, <laughs> right. we're, we're, we're doing a, um, we, we've got a hardtail coming soon. Uh, and that's, that's going to be a mullet hardtail for, uh, for a hardtail, it kind of makes sense that it allows us to have slightly shorter stays. And to me, the point of a hardtail is for fun. It's not for racing and for going fast. It's mm-hmm. for having fun on. So the mullet yeah. kind of makes sense on that bike that you've, you've got the shorter back end, but you've got the bigger wheel up front for a little bit of stability. But yeah, yeah, interesting. What is the is designing a bike like that more difficult, like in terms of the geometry and stuff, because it is using different wheel sizes and you have sort of different axle positions from front so, to back. So, so for I, all my bikes are actually designed so that the the bottom bracket main pivot shock mount seat tube that whole central area is identical on all my bikes mm. so mm. the 29 inch bike so the, the head tube is really the only thing that moves on the fork at the front so for a bigger bike the head tube moves forward for a longer fork or a 29 versus 27 the head tube moves up so you just move in that head tube position relative to everything else the same yeah. happens at the back. If you want to run a, a 27 inch wheel, you just need to drop the, the axle a little bit and move it in and make it a little bit shorter. So the only difference between my two swing arms is the axle position. So the the 27 one is 19 mil lower than the 29 inch one and it's 10 mil shorter. Mm-hmm. So then really yeah. this should be, it's very, very simple. But what's, what's happened is a load of brands have, have decided Oh, mullet's the thing to be. The mullet is the golden ticket, and they try to bodge a mullet into their into their existing bikes. And because mm-hmm. they don't want to change their swing arm design or their their swing arms aren't interchangeable, they start fiddling with linkages, and because that's the cheap bit to change. And mm-hmm. what 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 made me you know, bit of a run here? What made me very angry was when mullets first appeared and everyone said oh mullets are great because you've dropped your bottom bracket and you've made it you've made it uh lower and you've made it all slacker and i was like no no that's that's a bad mullet that's where you've <laughs> you've basically cocked the cocked the geometry up to put the wrong size wheel right. in the bike whereas yeah. I, all my bikes are the geometry isn't compromised by different wheel sizes mm-hmm. yeah and then i, I want one other point I'll, I'll keep i'll keep keep going <laughs> did, you, did you see did you see the the video we did about the tellum i did not Ah, watch, search up, I think it's on YouTube or it's on, uh, so the Starling Tellum, T-E-L-L-U-M. So that was a an April Fool's we did where we essentially built a reverse mullet. So that's very simple for us to do. We took a, we took a swoop front triangle and a murmur rear triangle and they all go together. And so we had 29 inch rear, 27 front. And my, my whole story was my, my logic that I explained before was totally wrong. I was just following, I was just following the trends. What's better yeah. is that your, your front wheel is really maneuverable and you can move it around and put it in different places. And then the rear wheel just tracks through, doesn't it? The rear wheel, you don't put any input. It just follows through. And this right. reverse mullet, which was a, an April fool's day, an April fool's joke actually ended right. A ride rode really well. It was really nice to ride. So oh, yeah, you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, you can apply, you can somewhere along the line, apply some kind of logic to make anything seem, anything seem good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a believable story for yeah. sure. Well, you mentioned the hardtail that's coming and then, yeah, you're working to get the the new spur models out the door. What else is next for Starling Cycles? Are there any steel e-bikes in your future, perhaps? Yeah, so we have a prototype steel e-bike. So there was a, there's a video on EMBN at the moment where uh, Steve Jones is, is reviewing the bike, working with a new motor company, UK-based motor company called FreeFlow. Um, so we've got one prototype. Um, it's got quite a small battery in it, but that was just to do with the steel tubes we got. So we're working on a second prototype at the moment right. to get a bigger battery in there. But it's yeah, it's yeah. lovely. It's it's jack drive. So if you like my stern, you've seen the downhill bike with the jack shaft. So like the left hand mm-hmm. drive cranks up to a up to a shaft or anything. So it's the same as that. So high pivot, jack okay. shaft, uh, one seventy travel. So that hopefully will be coming 
coming pretty soon or second prototype and then we shouldn't it's oh, not cool. that far from production really so yeah steel ear bike yeah. yeah it seems like that would be really challenging i mean i guess that's why i'm surprised is is that yeah you don't have the tube shapes maybe that kind of limits where you can put batteries and things and and the the motor and and all of that i mean i guess you can design around the motor but yeah, is, the, is the, the battery sort of more of the challenge uh, the, the motor, so this free flow, this free flow motor um, just sits in essentially an enlarged bottom bracket. So it's it's a 120 mil bottom bracket. So it's just a big mm-hmm. cylinder. Um, but they've now got a sort of clamshell type arrangement. But it's very simple to integrate that into bikes. Um, mm-hmm. The battery, the the first prototype, we were putting the battery inside the down tube. But once you start getting to large diameter steel tubes the wall thickness goes up so our our Mm. steel down tube weighed about three pounds it weighed an absolute maybe more than that so yeah we're now going to a solution with an external battery uh and then some kind of we're we're trying to design a structure around that to look nice potentially sort of maybe a motorbike type chassis or we're looking at kind of a carbon Mm. guard to protect it um and the the removable battery is quite good because it means you can either just put a spare in your pack or you just where we ride you, you just park at the bottom right. of the hill and go up and down so you just go to the bottom and stuff a new battery in. so uh mm-hmm. it's uh yeah it's looking quite good it's quite it's quite exciting and i think yeah. you've got to do an e-bike e-bikes are e-bikes are outselling other bikes this if i didn't have yeah. an e-bike <laughs> there's a risk <laughs> risk to the company really yeah yeah well, that's cool. Yeah, it's surprising, but yeah, fascinating that you're able to take steel and to do all these different things that, yeah. you know, maybe it seems like the bike industry moved past that a long time ago, right? Like they kind of decided that's old technology with steel, mm-hmm. but you and with Starling are able to show that it's super applicable and adaptable and yeah. works for all kinds of bikes. And that's that's really exciting. I think I think it, the the... I suppose I've been quite lucky that when I've started making bikes, um, you know, steel used to be the bike, the material to make bikes from, and then aluminium came along, mm-hmm. and then and then carbon, and steel have sort of dropped off the back. But then people have started not liking carbon for various reasons. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. not as tough. It you know, you get any bits bonded in fall out. If it get, takes a big mm-hmm. dent, you lose any confidence in it environmentally it's pretty disastrous as well and uh, right um so i think steel is sort of making a bit of a comeback and i've been lucky that i've appeared at the right time that people are starting to feel negatively about carbon and steel has then had the opportunity to, to rise again really so yeah you know I, I think if i tried to start styling 10 years ago nothing you know would have failed terribly but you know just timing yeah. been quite good Yeah. Fascinating. Well, Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. I learned a ton about steel bikes and I'm really excited to see what else you guys have in store. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I hope I haven't run it too much. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can find out more, see pictures of some of the bikes we're talking about and connect with Joe at starlingcycles.com. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. (laughs) 